Grand Rising fam, Adam Jackson here with another episode of the Sacred Sons podcast. He's back. Justin <laughs> Baldoni is in the house. And last time when we spoke, he undefined masculinity for us. This time he's armed with a new book. Boys will be human. Mm. And in one of the more poignant aspects of this book is that the truth that boys will become men. And so who is uh, stewarding these young men? Who is providing mentorship for these young men to actualize who it is that they are? And so I'm honored that Justin is joining us today and bringing these codes. I actually wanna to talk to you about, we have a son's youth program now. I wanna to talk to you about getting Boys Will Be Human in our book club. Uh, we have a we have a online cohorts of these young men, so let's do it. I'd love, and, I, and, I, and I'd love to join for a session. It'd be amazing. That would be amazing. We There's would do, nothing yeah. more meaningful than getting the real time feedback and and walking with these young boys and men as they kind of are on this journey. Because uh, yes. I rarely get a chance to interact with them uh, one on one. So I love popping in and, and joining book clubs like that. Amazing. And with that, our guest today, he's an actor, director, producer, entrepreneur, and change maker. He's got a purpose-driven film and television uh, company called Wayfarer Studios. He's the author of Man Enough, Undefining My Masculinity, and the new book, Boys Will Be Human. Please welcome Justin Baldoni. Thank you, Adam. Thanks for having me, man. Yes. It's, so it's good, good to see you again. Good to see you again. I love that you're still rocking the long hair. You know, it's so funny. I, I I haven't worn it down for a while, and then I saw I was looking on my schedule today, and I saw I was gonna see you, and I I would just I just worked out, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna rock it down. I'm like, you know, rock it down. It's a uh, Adam gives me permission to be my full self here, and uh, and I'm I'm with you. I'm with you with the long hair today. So I'll be your full masculine self. I got mine's going. Mine goes far, bro. Mine goes far. Yeah, it goes far. <laughs> well, let me different. ask you, right, yeah. before we drop in, I'll, I'll just share this piece with you because it's fresh. My son, Noah, he's eight years old. He also has long hair. He mm. just started getting teased at school. Mm. Boys, boys telling him that he looks like a girl or calling him a girl. And so he came home to me and like, dad, should I get a haircut? You know, they, the boys are saying I'm a girl. And I, and I kind of, my, my response is kind of like, you know, daddy has long hair and he said, yeah, but you have a beard, you know? And so he's really, oh. he's really in it, really feeling it. You know, you're writing this book. My son's eight. He's not quite the age for the book yet. However, oh. it's already coming up. Oh yeah. You know, this sense of bullying and you, and you touch on that in this book. Did you, did you have any of that experience in your, in your youth growing up with him? I'm, I'm just curious. I was so used you, you, yeah. you said to him, Daddy has oh. long hair. I'm, I would love to hear anything else you yeah, said. Let me, that. let me, yeah. let me, I'll, I'll complete the piece. But, um, you know, he said, yeah, but you have a beard. And, um, and I said, well, do you like your hair? And he said, yes. You know, do you like the way you feel and look? And, you know, we're just confirming and yeah. affirming like who he actually is and what he actually feels. Um, because a haircut for me is like, no problem. You know, we can do that. And I'll, I'll probably shed a tear, but <laughs> <laughs> I know, but no, it was really, um, coming back to who he is and who he knows he is. And so he mm. still has the long hair. And I just, I encouraged him. Like, all you have to do is respond with, no, I'm a boy and my name is Noah Jackson. You know, and just just that little nudge. Yeah. Just the, and, and even the fact that he feels safe enough to come to me and, and talk to me. Well, that's a, first of all, that's a huge win that your boy feels safe enough emotionally to tell you that. Because I don't think I felt... I mean, my dad's amazing, but I don't think I felt safe enough in myself to go and talk to them about those things. Right. And, and honestly, it wasn't until I went on this journey of trying to understand what happens to us as young boys that I even realized how gender was weaponized against us. Mm. And yeah. I, it wasn't, it was so normal. It was just a part of life. And I never thought twice about the harmful effect of what it was like to grow up in a culture that made me feel like 
I was not a man simply because I had feminine attributes or qualities. And the double-edged sword side of that is what it does to our brains in terms of how we view the opposite sex. Like, right. here, the, if the worst thing that I can be called is a girl, then how am I supposed to be in relation with them? <laughs> For those of us that are heterosexual, straight, how am I supposed to be in relation with them over the course of my life? How am I supposed to respect girls or women if I don't respect the parts of myself that looks like them? And especially if the characteristic uh, that is being reinforced is weakness, as if that's truth. Like, oh, I'm, which is I'm, which is the opposite if you really think about it. And so, and so, absolutely. The so, so, so to answer your question, so my son also has long hair. He's got amazing hair like <laughs> better, better hair than me. Like he, he, yeah. it's just, it's stunning his hair and, um, and he loves it. And it's become a sense of pride for him because everywhere he goes, people comment on him, uh, people comment on it, but right. he has, he, he has had people confuse him for a girl quite a few times. Yeah. Um, I, it, he's also very pretty. Like he's same just with, a same very with pretty boy. Yeah. He luckily got his mom's nose. <laughs> and, um, and oftentimes when he's with his sister, like just it happened uh, at brunch the other day, you know, someone says, bye girls. Right. And I can see he has a moment of, oh, wait, do I look like a girl? Is that bad? But one of the things that we always reinforce in him is, just how amazing and powerful and badass girls are and that there isn't a competition between like being a boy or being a girl or being called a girl, being called a boy. It's just like having reverence and respect for the feminine um, and just how amazing they are. And I, and I, and I tell them all the time, like, look at what you look at your mom. She's a fucking warrior. Look at what she did. Like she gave birth to you. Like, look at all that. Th like, look at, look at how she is in the world. Like, look at your sister and how cool she is. Um, look at all these women. And it's, it, it, for me, it's more lifting up the station of women. Um, so that he can grow up thinking that, oh, that's not a bad thing. I'm a human. Like right. I'm a boy, I'm a girl. Like, so, so wait, so I have long hair. So boy, who says boys can't have long hair? The, bad, um, the some of the raddest men in history had long hair. In history, we're talking about the warriors, the samurai. Oh yeah, and wore dresses. Oh, you know, <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, like think wore about kills, it for a kills, Armor. exactly. Yes, yeah. So it's just this time that we're in, and our uh, our deep insecurities that we are just not enough. That we have to then put other people down to make ourselves feel better which is the other thing that i tell him as i say you know yeah. the only reason somebody else laughs at you or will say something to you is because they don't feel good about themselves and I'm like do you like your hair do you how do you feel i like right. it good that's all that matters but it did happen the other day with some friends my son wanted to wear my daughter's pajamas and they were they had unicorns on them and we were having a sleepover some, with some of our best friends and the, it came from the girl actually who laughed at him yeah and was confused of why he was wearing unicorns and he was so excited to wear the unicorns <laughs> but the second right. she laughed at him ah oh. he took them off he's like i don't want them i don't want them and i and and i got triggered which was wow. interesting and then my wife had to tell me babe this is not about maxwell anymore this is about you because i said no no you keep them on <laughs> I was like, you keep on, <laughs> like you, you keep, keep those, those unicorn unicorns. pajamas. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna get the unicorn pajamas. And I pulled up Amazon. And I'm like, you know what? Daddy's gonna get. And I, and I, I, it became more about me than about his emotional experience. And luckily, Emily, yes. who's in yes. the other room making tea, who just looked back and smiled at me. Luckily, she called <laughs> me out on it because it was because I, I was watching, I was watching in real time the effect that somebody else can have on our own belief systems. And there were so many times in my own life that I took off the pajamas, that I cut the hair, that I did the thing just because somebody else laughed at me or didn't have the approval. And it was really hard for me in that moment to just hold him and to hold where he was and to say, okay, you can take it off. 
But just remember, you really liked those things and you really right. liked unicorns. Instead, it became about me and like this, like, no, I got to prove to you that, that men wear unicorns. And that's the thing. It's like our children trigger us. And we're watching the things happen to our children on a daily basis that yeah. never got healed in ourselves when we were, when we were kids. And luckily, the, the wounds in from my the case, playground, I like to call oh, it. They, they, they carry, they're with you forever. And nobody ever held that from me. Nobody ever, my parents never told me how awesome girls were. Not that they didn't think that, but it just wasn't in their tool, tool belt. Or I never saw my dad wear pink or those, you know, quote unquote feminine, if we deem them feminine colors. And I certainly never had him do what I did, which is to try to just reinforce the idea that it's cool. Um, so I just, I got very triggered and, uh, and what we're just constantly doing is just reminding him every day, just like you did. Like, well, how do you feel? You like your hair? Do you want, you want to wear your hair like daddy? And he's smart enough to go like, no, I don't. <laughs> so right. I don't want to wear a man, but he does it his own way. Uh, thank you, baby. Yeah. Have you gotten in <laughs> off topic? You got any, any cornrows, any braids for him? That's what Noah, Noah does the two braids down the top that he really loves. <laughs> uh, we haven't, we haven't gotten into uh, to braids or, cor or cornrows yet. What he is doing now, which is kind of fun is he decided to start wearing a ponytail, but like almost like a unicorn and it kind yeah. of just folds over and I've never seen anybody do it. And he just looks so cool. He's one of these kids that just looks cool doing anything and wearing anything, which is what I try which is, right. I think one of the reasons why I'm so frustrated by other kids is I know they're going to try to police him into, you know, being more like them, but he's also the kid that if he decided to go to school in unicorn pajamas, then all the other kids would wear unicorn pajamas. Yeah. Um, so I just want him to have that sense of, self that i never had because i was chasing approval throughout my entire prepubescent and pubescent journey i just wanted other kids and other boys to see me as enough and i wanted to be like everybody else and i didn't have that natural confidence that honestly my son has and i have to attribute that to just constantly reminding him of his enoughness and his worth and and hopefully um that's really settling yeah. in you said a couple of things in there, but absolutely bringing that remembrance of who you actually are is so huge for all of us. When we get those reflections from our friends, from our family, from people who really care about us, like say, no, no, you're actually, you actually have a great voice or whatever the thing is. Yeah. <laughs> when we get, when we get our feelings smashed in those, uh, in those schools and playgrounds, let's, let's talk a little bit about the book. You know, I said last time you, you brought through the, concept of undefining masculinity. Why did you want to make this book for the young men, for the boys? Well, honestly, this book was more important to me than the other ones. Yeah. But you know how um, book deals work and social media and celebrity and um, you got to kind of do the, the sexy one first, you know, which they right. think will sell more copies and all that. I, it was the, the way I think about it is the first book was really my exploration and my journey of unpacking and undefining my masculinity and using myself as an example to hopefully give men permission to, to do the same. Yes. Um, it's not a self-help book by any means. It's a really raw, as you know, unfiltered look at um, what it's like to grow up as a boy and a man and all the ways that we can improve. And I start with myself. Um, but as you know, doing this work, you can be and meet a hundred men on a given day, but maybe only a handful of them are ready to do the work or even are able to see that they need to. Um, it's one of the, it's one of the, the benefits of privilege, right? Willi is willingness, that, willingness is often that first step is someone willing to either take a look or to actually take a step. You know, but you can't even be willing if you don't see it, which is which is the benefit of privilege, right? For those True. who have it, it's invisible. Like yeah. you don't think that there's a need, there's no issue, and a lot of men don't or are not even self aware enough or have done the work to realize they need to heal. Yeah. Um. And so I said, okay, well, the first book did well. It's it's gotten to the hands of a lot of men, the people, the men who find it. Um, need it and vice versa. But 
the work really starts with boys. This is where all of it starts for us. We start to put the armor on, that proverbial armor on when we are eight, nine, ten years old, as we're finding. I mean, yeah. five five years old, I had a Maxwell came home and told me that a boy in his class told him that he never cries ever. Um, Already. And I, wow. And I was like, okay, well, I'm like, I know his daddy, and I can promise you that that's not true. <laughs> um, his daddy cries, I assure you. But of course, this poor kid was going through a situation where his mom and dad are getting a divorce, and he's got all this stuff going on, and he was bullying my son. And you can see the seeds of all of these things start to happen that we're going to be experiencing for the rest of our lives as grown adult men. And I wanted to reach boys where they were. Because we don't, we don't reach boys. We don't even try to reach boys. There's no section for boys. There's no section of the bookstore for boys. The only things for boys are video games and like fantasy books. Like there's nothing that, that applies to their emotional or spiritual development right now. There's like an entire category that's I, missing. I'd say it's even worse. I'd say it's even worse and a little more sinister than that is what a lot of young boys are getting is diagnosed. It's like diagnosed for medicated and diagnosed oh, ADHD, yeah. ADD, and getting di diagnosed and medicated. And I think that's even worse and more harmful than Agreed. Like, here. Here's a little bit of mentorship. And, and, and by the way, it's absolutely okay for you to feel the energy coursing through your veins and want to go smash stuff because we all have it at some point. So get in that sandbox or that trampoline and get, get that energy out. But instead it gets stuff stuff down suppressed and like i said you know yeah because we want our boys to be able to sit still in a classroom that was not designed for them at all we're not designed <laughs> to sit in classrooms when we're four and seven and ten we're designed to be out in the world in the mud climbing like trees dirty, as we were talking about climbing trees like like with with community like with other male mentors like that's how it was designed right so we're trying to fit these these boys and girls, honestly, into a school system that wasn't designed for them and has never been designed. This, we're talking about a modern invention of only a few hundred years, if that. Absolutely. This is this is not how it was how it was ever done before. And we're and so yeah, we're medicating them. We're making them feel like they are not enough, like they're not smart enough. Um, I know I went through that exact same thing. I'm a physical man. I was a kinesthetic learner. I had testosterone coursing through my veins as a kid. And I was too much for all the teachers. Yeah, I was. I was gonna say there's a there's a there's a pendulum of you're either not enough or you're too much. Those are the two lanes. I was both. Young men get but get put in. <laughs> and and I want to uh, encapsulate yeah. what you're saying here because I, I often reference this Frederick Douglass quote, which is it is easier mm -hmm. to raise strong boys than to than to repair broken men. Oh yeah, and I think that it, that is so poignant and it's that's why i wrote the book that's why i wrote the book for young boys is because i noticed that it was i was just reaching a point where the barrier to entry was just too much yeah. um which is why even on the even on the the soft cover edition of the book the paperback i told them to take my face off it because even that was too much like um, like there was a, I was getting messages like that men were reading the book with the cover off of it. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I was getting, I was getting messages that men were, were reading the book with the cover off of it in public right. because it was embarrassing. The idea that they're reading a book from this guy who is talking about masculinity, like they didn't want to be looked down on by other men. And so the next version of the book didn't have a, didn't have my face on it. Wow. Um, there was just there was just so many barriers to entry, and I and I wanted to get to boys before they became men, before we put the armor on, before all the destruction and the bullying and the policing starts, before we start to change ourselves to try to fit in with everybody else, so that we could hopefully reach young boys and let them know that who they are as they are right now is enough. Because I never got that, so I wrote a book that I wish I had. When I was 10, 12, 14, can we, 16, can we, bring, can we bring some of the real, real here though? Because it's not just like, oh, our boys are going to be, you know, they're going to have character and they're going to be more kind. I mean, we are in no. 2023. Young boys are, are shooting up schools and 
public places, overdosing, fentanyl is running rampant through killing the themselves, communities of young taking people, their own lives, of teenagers, of young men. Yes. Yeah. I mean, this is, it's the realest of the real in terms, in terms of kind of like this epidemic of toxic masculinity and what that kind of uh, framing in, in education and kind of like uh, the indoctrination of masculinity being toxic, you're right, has done to, to these young men. I mean, that is exactly what's happening. Yes. And um, even more so at that age, as we talked about earlier, the school systems are not designed for young boys. Um, there are so few male teachers right. in middle school and elementary school. So there's no, um, there's no male guidance oftentimes there. Teachers are overwhelmed as they are. Boys were performing year over year worse than girls. Our, our universities are now lopsided, right? Now we're talking about 65% women. Men are not even making it to university anymore and are not graduating at the same rates. We're just not doing well. Yeah. Um, and I believe it starts at, in this age group. And, um, and yeah, look, so, so, you know, what's the, what's the antidote to all of these things? Mm -hmm. There's not a simple answer. But my view on it is that we have to, we have to teach our boys how to be human. And that's why I call the boys will be human with boys crossed out. It's not like there's anything wrong with being a boy. But the idea of how we've made this excuse forever, boys will be boys. Oh, right. now we don't, we don't need any books for boys about emotional development. Boys will be boys. They'll be fine. Right. We've like, like dis we, it's discarding all of the gifts. <laughs> it's almost as if we've, 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 we've abandoned boys and we've like put them on an island and said go fend for yourselves yeah. while we just put all our energy and attention in, into girls um but the reason why we have to do that is because we have a problem with boys in the first place so it's like we're just keep we just keep putting band-aids on the larger issues yeah um and so Let's if we were go. to teach our boys at young ages all these things as an example like we wouldn't have sexual assault in the way that we have it because we're, te we're teaching boys at young ages, what consent is and what, Absolutely. Um, and what uh, sex is and what it is not. It, it, this is just one example. But so that's why I say, we got to go to the, we got to go to the source. We got to go to boys before they become men and remind them that they are beautiful, that they are emotional, that they are empathetic. They are kind. That they're enough. Yeah. And so I noticed that you started the book by establishing trust. I think this is hugely important as a foundation for yeah. hon honest and healthy masculinity, you know, and you do that by describing who you are, but also just to um, instill that as a foundation, I think is hugely important. Why did you want to bring trust in? Not a lot of authors are doing this before they start a book. Hey, just so you know, this is who I actually am. <laughs> right. What do you have if you don't have trust? Um, and in any in any relationship, I mean, I'm sure it's. I, I haven't had the the pleasure, and I will of of coming through um, the the program. But at the beginning, it's the absolute of, at the first beginning, thing we're doing. You can't do anything. Trust. Yeah, you can't do anything. There's no chance that I'm going to be vulnerable with you if I don't trust you. If I think that you're going to use or weaponize my vulnerability, um, and it, it, in this age group. When I tap into what I felt when I was that age, I didn't feel like I could trust anybody. Yeah. I didn't feel like I could trust anybody with my feelings, with what I was experiencing. Um, and I wanted these young boys to have a place when, when they read the book, they saw I wasn't trying to push a political agenda on them. Because I know that, of course, that permeates down from the parents and, and we absorb ideologies. I wasn't trying to say like one side is right. This is not a political book by any means. This is a book about being human. And the only way I could start that is by saying, and here are the things that make me human. And this book is going to get uncomfortable and I'm going to get vulnerable with you, but hopefully we'll be friends. And then I'm going to ask you to think about the things that my stories trigger in you. And maybe you can find someone to talk to about it, or maybe you can at least think about it. Um, but if I don't have that trust with the reader, if I don't have that trust with that young boy, if I can't be the older brother, then 
nothing that I say is gonna 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 sit. It's not gonna it's not gonna it's not gonna turn into anything. The seed will not be watered and grow into a beautiful tree. Yeah, absolutely. When we invite men into our spaces, first we have agreements, and agreements are a great starting point for building trust. Our grief, our agreements are defined as chaos and order. Chaos being confidentiality, honesty, acceptance, ownership, and the sacred. So we go through these agreements, make their agreements, and then we we literally do, you know, trust magnetics and different pieces where we're having men express where they are potentially easily easily trusting, overly trusting, and who they automatically have distrust for in the group without names, mm-hmm. without knowing anything about these men, we, we just go right in and, and speak directly to it. And that's, it's also a, a piece with, you know, wearing masks. No one really asks us, you know, no one takes the time to get in and to like ask us how we are, how we are feeling, how we are engaging in. Um, no one yeah, ever just, asks men how we're feeling. That's strange. not a conversation. And Part of it is because we don't have an answer. Men don't have <laughs> vocabulary. We don't have a vocabulary for how we're feeling. Like, it, I'm sure if I asked you how you were feeling, and I, I know we didn't, you know, drop in today with and start it check in, in yeah. that way, but but uh, you me, will give me, you'll me. give me. How are you feeling? Now? Physically, I'm feeling a little bit swole. I had a good workout. I had a good pump this morning, so that feels good. Uh, emotionally, I'm feeling joy. Mentally, I'm feeling intrigued because we're having a great conversation here. And spiritually, I feel connected. Um, and so now, if that's, I, that's if literally I how you I that, if I would have asked you that as a 17 year old, you wouldn't have had the vocabulary for that. I would have been or like, as a 25 like, year old, I'm fine. And I'd be like, who are you, dude? Yeah. <laughs> Why are you I'm asking good. me that? I'm good. And then you would have judged me for even asking you. We don't have, there's no vocabulary for what we feel or how well, we feel. Let's, let's give it some vocabulary just for, for yeah. those listening. You know, let's say there's a brother out there listening right now who doesn't actually have vocabulary for how it's feeling. I use PEMS, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual check in. I think it's a beautiful and mm. simple way to like actually, men, we, we actually do a good job when we compartmentalize. And so giving the prompt, yeah. because if you just said, if you go, how are you feeling entirely? It's like, you may feel really great in your finances, but your back is, you're, you may be going in for back surgery tomorrow. I have no idea. Right. Yeah. But let me ask you, and I want to hear your languaging. How are you feeling, Justin? Oh, thank you for asking, Adam. Um, physically, I, I also feel, I feel good. Uh, I've been, I've been, um, I had, a, I had a good workout this morning. Emotionally, I feel feel I feel content spiritually. I'm I'm feeling. Um, Spiritually, I'm feeling uh, some shame mm. because I feel like I, uh, I feel like I the last few days I haven't been putting that in front and center. So I have to turn. I have to allow that shame to come up and and not let that keep me from doing the thing that actually I want to do. Yeah. Um, and I'm also feeling I'm also feeling uh, excitement right now um, for things that are happening in my career and various things. Um, I'm feeling a lot of things. And then you know what? It'll change tomorrow. This is the point. And, and, And I remember when I was asked this question by a therapist a few years ago, I didn't have an answer. And the answer that I gave was more theoretical or it was more practical. It was like, I think... I'm, and, and he had to stop me and he asked me, well, no, no, no those, those aren't feelings. Um, joy, you know, gratitude, like, like, sure. But 
I wasn't giving feelings. I don't have, I'm still not great at it to be perfectly honest. And so yeah. I, I want to make, I want to make sure that men listening know that when I'm saying we don't have a vocabulary for it, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I'm saying, how can we have a vocabulary for it? If nobody's ever fucking asked us how we're feeling, because as men, we're <laughs> supposed to, we're supposed to feel strong and put together even when we're not right. No pain, no gain. Suck it up. Fake it till you make it, you know, don't be so a we bitch. A lot like, of it, all dude, of it. We're seeing so many examples of that in popular culture from the liver King uh, coming out and lying about steroids. It's like, man, how's that dude feeling? He, 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 you know, he's, he's out here. He's preaching his tenets. He's yeah. severely insecure to the point where he's loads of steroids, you know, and hiding it. So we, yeah. we keep seeing it coming out in popular culture, brother after brother, man after man. And then we see it in, yeah. you know, this is, this is, we see it in the tragic, you know, I don't want to make light of this stuff. We see it in the tragic suicides of those who are still wearing that mask of yeah. perfection, of rigidity and, and not feeling and not acknowledging. That's why it's important that we're talking about. This. We, it's ex because but that's exactly it. No, dude, yeah. that's exactly it. And because we don't have vocabulary for it, because nobody's ever asked us, we put on this armor yeah. and we just eventually, you know, the way that I write about it in the book, is I, I give I give kids this analogy of a balloon, and you can if you if you keep blowing up a balloon, eventually it's going to burst. And we are balloons, right? If you keep, I have plants here. If I were just to water them and water them and water them, eventually it would kill the plant. Yeah. If I'm everything in life has an in and out, a pattern, a wave, um, and our breath like if i were just to keep breathing in and in and in i would explode and out 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 i would die it doesn't like nothing functions when we just are all one thing and we are holding everything in and yet as men somehow we've been taught that this is the secret to life right and that this is masculinity when it's the opposite it's the thing that's killing us it's the thing that's destroying us it is the thing that is created if they're the the, the patriarchal structure that exists literally because as men, we don't have an outlet. We don't know how to get in touch with who we are, or our feelings, and we're so afraid of them because there's so much anger and rage underneath that we just keep suppressing and suppressing and suppressing. And eventually that comes out either in sexual abuse and domestic abuse, in, in cutting and in suicide and drug use and addiction, all of it. It's all rooted in the same thing. Gabor Mate's new book, um, which is fantastic, which I encourage everybody listening to this podcast to read, The Myth of Normal talks a lot about trauma and the ways that we store it in our bodies and then the ways that we don't let it out and how it's tied to all health conditions and from autoimmune disorders to, to hypertension in men, you name it. Yeah. All of it comes from these things that we're storing. So we have to let it out. One of the things I love, and I don't know if I've uh, talked about this publicly, is my favorite superhero has become Black Panther. <laughs> and it's because... His suit, right? His suit is, is the example of masculinity and that he, he takes abuse. He takes these hits, he takes violence and it all stores in his suit. And then he uses that he, and he releases it and that becomes his superpower. And I was like, wait, has, has anybody ever deconstructed this and thought about how this relates to masculinity? Like, this is what we need to be doing. Now, of course, he is black, and I look at it with microaggressions and all that, and racism and all this shit, and he's basically taking all that and he's using it again. But it's the same thing with men. Yeah. We don't have the ability to let it out. So he controls when it comes out. All of us, it just explodes out when we don't want it to because we don't have the vocabulary. So we need to find it. So what do I do? I have to learn how to sit with myself. I have to learn how to sit with my feelings. I have to learn how to sit and be still and resist the urge to go look at porn or check my email or look at Instagram or do one of the thousand things that I've become so masterful at doing to simply ignore the feelings that are trying to come up and tell me something. And it could be as simple as sitting down and checking in and taking a breath and asking myself like, okay, what am I feeling right now? Because I just got angry at my wife for no reason. Okay, I just snapped at my kids. I just had road rage. 
what's underneath what is under exactly what is why what is behind it and we never take the time to dig in and to look yes. behind the thing and then what you often find is it's got nothing to do it happened two days ago or it happened five days ago or it's a trauma that i'm still working on healing or it's the thing that happened when my first girlfriend cheated on me when right. i was 18 and and what i do now is when i sit when i sit into it and i breathe into it i'll start to get images and feelings will come up and i'll realize oh that's where and then i'll just follow it and i'll go down that path and before i know it i'm sobbing or i'm yelling and i'm screaming and i'm like i'm I, it's coming out of me in this primal way and then i'm okay and it's no different adam than what your son and my kids do when they feel upset. They have a tantrum, just like the suit and Black Panther. It has to come out. All the little traumas they absorb that their brain doesn't to. have the capacity. They don't have the capacity to rationalize a lot of the things that happen during the day, or they don't have um, the cognitive or emotional intelligence to know that, oh, that girl didn't want to play with me, and that made me feel really sad but I'm just going to keep going. And then eventually that comes out and boom, it comes out and they have a tantrum and they've, they're freaking out about the color of the plate or the spoon or the broccoli touching the whatever. Right. But that is them releasing it so that then they can move on, which is why kids can laugh 30 seconds after they just had the biggest tantrum in the world. Their body is not storing it anymore. This is what us men, need. this is what we have yeah. to learn how to do to free ourselves and of the, of the, the shit and the, the traumas and the micro traumas that happen to us every day, because let's be, let's face it. It's fucking yeah. hard existing as a human being in 2023. It's hard Absolutely. being a man with the, the things that are um, put on our shoulders and expected of us on a given, on, a, on any given day. And what the pressure that we have to support and provide for our families to have our shit together so that we don't come off as, as, um, as being weak or, not being able to be good at our jobs. Like we carry so much on our shoulders. Where does it go? We can't give it to our wives. We can't give it to our children. We have to find a way to let it out. Up sacred sons. <laughs> it's called the work, you know, yeah. and it doesn't have to be with sacred sons. There are so many people. Yeah. That's, the, that's the other thing about men. There are actually so many uh, humans out there who are willing to hold that space for other human beings to do those very things, to let go of the trauma, to let go of the anger, to let go of the, the grief. You know, I, I just spoke with uh, uh, Anahita Anayas. Uh, she's an Iranian woman. She talked about how they have professional grievers. And especially at this time, there's so much happening where there are mm. other human beings who are regulated to some standard, you know, who are willing to come into that space and be in to be a vessel, yeah. you know, to, to just be there, to stand in it, and to to acknowledge it, to encourage it. And it's not. This is this is something I want to be clear here. I think both for you and I, we're not inviting men to be more emotional, um, and specifically not like to have it come out around their wives and children, like what you're expressing. That's not the point. It's to have a place to fall apart, to express. And to be witnessed so that you can go home with that cup full, fully resourced, back in your body with the trauma, ha having been cleared, witnessed, held, whatever it needed, right? Or partly cleared, yeah. Because it'll, it'll never be fully cleared, which is the other thing that's important for men to know. So you're never just going to get rid of it. It's not gone forever. And healing is, is not linear. The work is never right? done. The work it's, is never done. It's, no, it's not about it's not it's not about well, being more. But behavior, and it, and it, but behavior. Just to be just to wrap that up, behavior yeah. does change. And so what I'm saying is 100%. Going, going from allowing it to come up when we don't want it to come up, and it's like you said, that is it's going to come up and out in some form or fashion. So whether you're hitting the punching bag in the garage at the gym, whether you're getting down and dirty doing the shadow work, it's like what is effective to make sure that the behavioral change sticks. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. And especially if you were a man and in any way you were like a little triggered thinking about, you know, needing to be more emotional. What I would, what I would offer you is that you already are. Totally. You've just <laughs> yeah. learned, you've just learned how to, 
how to pretend that you're not. Yes. You know, in my first book, I talk about, you know, a study that was done that showed that men are every bit, if not more emotional and reactive than women. We just quickly learn that that's not acceptable. Um, It's not masculine. So we suppress it. It's what bell hooks call soul murder. Mm. At a very early age, we learn how to suppress our emotions and our feelings. And by doing so, we essentially are murdering our souls. I believe in the Baha'i faith, and this is not a Baha'i quote by any means, but I do believe that feelings and emotions are attributes of the soul. And when we are suppressing those things, we're denying ourselves of our existence, of our humanity. So it's not about trying to be or saying we men need to be more emotional. No, men already are emotional. We just pretend that we're not. And you need to find a safe space to allow yourself to be emotional if you want to have any sort of happy life or positive impact on humanity or your children. We need to see men thriving and and living in their joy and being happy and free and out of their cage. So I, uh, I, I, I couldn't encourage doing the work that you do enough. Um, not all men have access or can afford to go to um, these types of workshops, but I will tell you that some of my most impactful experiences have happened by myself, mm. you know, going into the garage, doing breath work, um, sitting with myself, you know, and, and just allowing myself to experience whatever the fuck is underneath and screaming and yelling and just and and then crying i've gone through all the stages and i have found myself at 30 i'll be 39 soon where i look identical to my children having a tantrum right. now granted nobody gets this that's for me nobody sees right. that right my family knows i tell my wife i gotta get some stuff out i'll go into the garage and she supports that because she does her version of that work with the family yeah but but we need that and if you don't have that then I do think it would be, I don't know if you offer online, online things, but just Absolutely. any, any place a man can go to feel free enough and safe enough to release is going to be the, some of the most beneficial things he could do, not just for himself, but for his family yeah, and his overall health. It, what, what comes on the flip side of this too, that I've discovered in my own experience is when we're a witness to it, when we hold that space for ourselves and others, all of a sudden we are more resourced and capable to hold that space for the feminine, for the tantrum of our toddlers. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've experienced it in myself. My first son, Noah, he's, like I said, he's eight. eight uh, six years ago when he was two and having a tantrum, my capacity to hold that and to understand what was happening and, and to show up in the moment was like a, mm-hmm. tenth, a, a tenth of where it is now with Holland at three years old. I learned so much along the way. I made so many mistakes. I tried to overpower. I tried to to be louder than, to get big, to tell them to stop. And over time, and in, in, in kind of like being confronted in myself, and also witnessing others go through it, it's really allowed me to slow down. Yeah. And and to understand what's actually important here. You know, it's my son. And you can all, and you can almost see the wave happen once you've experienced what release feels like you can start to see the wave um, of healing in real time. And, um, and I was pretty blown away how much I could hold once I started doing the work. A lot of people don't realize that the reason that they can't hold as like, as an example, parents who get really frustrated by tantrums, it's very simple. They weren't allowed to have them themselves. So when you see a child have a tantrum and you were somebody that was told you weren't allowed to have a tantrum growing up, you don't realize it, but there's jealousy. So yeah, so, uh, so a lot of parents don't realize that when they're triggered by their children, it's because they were deprived of that thing. Yes. So the way that's shown up for me is that, you know, when I, um, when I had first saw my kids having tantrums and I was really frustrated by it, When I went into it, I realized I wasn't allowed to have a tantrum. So there was jealousy there. Well, how I didn't get that. You don't get that. 
Right. Um, Almost like you're you're so privileged uh, to you to that. Yeah, I'm you're so this. exactly. <laughs> and and um and then you know that showed up for me in a big way when it came to, I you know I had a lot of shame and guilt because I I really, um, I really was frustrated by my inability to be creative in play with my children. Yeah. I'm creative in all these areas, but there was like this, there was like this block for me when it came down to getting on my hands and knees and just like being creative. And some people are amazing at that. Some men are fantastic at that. And I didn't know what was wrong and it was eating me because I felt like a terrible father. I'm good at all these things. Why, why can't I get on the ground and just play until I went deep and had a remembering of the fact that I was not played with. So I didn't know how to play. Yeah. And so then it wasn't my fault. And it's not my parents' fault either because they were amazing parents and they did the best that they could. But what was coming up for me in that moment was simply I was being held, a, a mirror was being held to my face and my little boy who wants to play with me and says, can I play? I was just acting out what happened with my dad, which is he was too busy with work. Mm. And then I go, oh, wait, that's, I'm like, okay, I, I have to work through this. And then you get on your hands and knees and you feel like you're, you don't have anything to offer your kids. And I'm speaking, you know, I don't feel like I have anything to offer my kids. And then I had to go into that. Right. And it's just an unknown thing. And then play starts to come out and you realize like, oh no, I can do this. And so it's just, we just have to be self-aware and be willing to do that work and understand like where these feelings are coming from in the first place. And most of us just frankly don't have the time, don't have the experience, the vocabulary, and nobody's ever told us that this was an option. Yeah. It's just the way things are. And we are the way things, we are the, the parents we are because our parents were the way that they are, or we're trying to not be the parents that they were. But it's never coming from within. Like, what is the parent that I want to be? What are my roadblocks in with my kids or in my relationship with my wife? Or and this yeah. is this this is the practice that gets applied to everything. You you really just illuminated something in my life with that. <clears throat> that's 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 real. And I had an older brother. I have an older brother. We wrestled all the time with my boys. I have three boys. I'm so blessed to have boys, and we wrestle. I'm talking off the couch, top rope, dropping elbows. Oh, yeah. I'm like I, I'm a natural. I'm a natural for this. <laughs> and sometimes my relationship with Hannah strains. I'm so in love with my kids that sometimes I, in like in, in the moments, like I'm not tending to the relationship. Mm. And what you just connected is because I was raised by a single mother. You know, Noah just came up here asking me, uh, my mom's actually in town visiting for three weeks, which is rare, but it's great to have mm. grandma energy around. But I was just, you know, I'm so grateful for my mom uh, for raising me. However, I had no visual cognitive example of how a relationship was supposed to work. I only mm. saw my mom and a, a lot of the time I saw her struggling because she was yeah. raising three kids solo. Damn. And so what you just did there, I mean, it, it, this is probably a piece of why, like, I'll go so hard in the other direction. Like, I got the kids, we're off. And I'm neglecting the relationship. Mm -hmm. I need to talk to Hannah. <laughs> this is what we do man and, and, it, and it's not it's not our fault it's we're playing it out we're playing out the the shadows of the father will be revealed in the sons yes you know what i'm saying and i want to i wanted yeah. to say this there's a Rumi quote that is just so precise here because this is the antidote to what we're talking about it's Rumi. if you haven't been fed become bread and so if you didn't have the father who played with you or threw catch with you if you didn't have the father uh, that braided your hair if you have daughters, right? Whatever, you know, whatever those, those the, the scenarios are that, that get us in a place of stuckness and of why can't I, Ness? It's like, if you haven't been fed, the best thing you can do is become bread. Become mm -hmm. the thing that you didn't have. It's in all of our power. It's the only way that, it's the only way that the world changes and improves upon itself. Yeah. Because if we just keep repeating the same thing over and over again, that's just the definition of insanity. And we're not going to, we're going to destroy ourselves before we even can <laughs> see if it works. And we're, and, and we're not, we're not here to destroy ourselves. We are cycle breakers. We are generational, you know, lineal traumatic healers. 
alchemical stewards of this Hell human, yeah, we are. of this thing we call humanity. Truly, yeah. we're, we we are here I, to steward to steward this, and so yeah, I, I just want to just to say again to encourage. It's the most radical form of healing possible to provide someone the thing that you didn't have in a good way. I'll give you a quote from my wife, who I think is, uh, she's an alchemist. She's my witch. Yeah. Um, yes. She said to me once, as we were digging into all of this, the greatest activism is self-activism. You can't even begin to try to change the world until you, until you dig into all this stuff. Nothing else, nothing starts. It doesn't matter what you put on your social media. It doesn't matter how many followers you have or like, you know, if you wear your Black Lives Matter t-shirt or, you know, whatever current trendy, you know, active activist thing that there is to do. It doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't, doesn't matter, honestly, like how loving you are to your kids or your spouse. Like, you have to do that work because eventually the dam will break. And you have to know what you're made of and who you are and what your shadow side looks like and learn how to embrace it and to love it and recognize that just even though you have it underneath it is pure, unconditional love from God, from the great mother, from whatever you believe in. That's there always, just behind the clouds, right? A cloudy day, you can still get sunburned. Just behind the clouds is sun. It's always shining. We just can't always see it. This is what life is this is what love is and we're so averse to accepting love and i am a perfect example of it i am somebody who struggles so hard with the recognition that i am deeply held and loved and it's something that i have to dig into and work on on a daily basis and it just comes from my childhood and it, it filters into all of my actions, into why when I was at, bringing it back to middle school, why I cared so much about what other people thought. Yeah. It just, I just wanted to be loved, which is really fundamentally what all of us want and need, is to be loved and held and nurtured and seen for who we are and that we are enough. So bringing it all the way back, we can teach our young boys some of these things can teach our young boys that they are unconditionally loved. It doesn't matter how book smart they are or how cool they are, or what clothes they wear or how big their dicks are or like anything. If we can just have them realize that they have something to offer this world more than just what our society tells them that they should be, I really think that we can start to do some incredible healing and that this next generation will become the bread to bring it back. Yes. To <clears throat> Beautiful. Boys will be brave. Boys will be cool. Boys will be smart, bigger. Boys will be knights and boys will be human. Pick up the book. It's out now, Justin. It, it's always, it's always good to drop in. Let's do yeah, it. It's fun to drop time. in with you, man. Yes. Come up. Come on up and visit in Ojai, man. We'd love to have you. And we have a beautiful property here in uh, an ancient Chumash land that I want to honor and continue. Yes. Uh, yeah. To deepen. Let's continue deepening. With that, Justin, is there anything that you would like to leave with the brothers and sisters who are listening? Mm. If you're listening to this already, I think you're you're on the right track and doing so much work. Um. And uh, and I'm just grateful because if you're listening to this and you're doing the work and thinking about these things that Adam is talking about, I think that that it's uh, it's one step towards our world finding equilibrium and balance because we we very much need it right now. So I really do. It's just simply thank you. Thank you. Thanks for letting me wear my hair down today, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I like to bring that. I like to bring the edge. I get a lot of the, uh, yeah. I get a lot of dad projections. Don't get me wrong, but like the wild man as well. You know. Oh man, I'm I'm embracing. I'm learning how to embrace my wild man. It's really fun because I never could when I was when I was when I was growing up. And uh, go talk to Hannah. <laughs> We're gonna talk to Hannah. Thanks for <laughs> eliminating this for me on this day. With that. Sacred Sons, Adam Jackson, Justin Baldoni, boys will be human. We're out, family. Peace.